Hey everyone, welcome to today's lecture. What we're going to talk about deals very much with what you see in the picture below. and We're going to start to delve into how do you understand materials and when they will fail. So, in this lecture, we're going to focus on two different things. First and foremost, we're going to begin to introduce the idea of stress. And specifically in this lecture, we're going to focus on the concept of normal stress. Secondly, we're going to also focus on safety factors and discuss how that is applied and used by engineers in engineering design work. Ultimately, by the end of this class, you'll be able to answer this question, which is, what is stress? And you'll be able to know whether or not a material will fail under certain loading conditions. This is what we're going to start to talk about today. And in addition to these things, hopefully you laugh at the most ridiculous joke I've probably ever crafted for a class. So enjoy. To get things started off, I want to begin with a little story and ask you some questions. Let's say that you're walking around campus one day and you find yourself by Lake Artemisia. Now we all know on campus there's a giant cliff that falls about 7,000 feet into the center of the earth. Let's say that you're walking along, you're on your cell phone and you fall off the cliff because you were TikToking or doing something silly. As you fall off, unfortunately your phone <whistles> falls to its death but fortunately, you're able to grab onto the cliff and hold on. Now, luckily for you, I walk by at this exact moment and you say, Oh my God, Mike, you're my NES 102 instructor. Please help me. And I'm about to reach down and grab you and I go, Wait a minute. This is a perfect teachable moment. And I craft a perfect demo. So, here we go. As you're hanging on for dear life, I say, Okay. I've got two ropes here, rope A and rope B. Rope A has a diameter of one millimeter and rope B has a diameter of 10 millimeters. So if both ropes are made of the same exact material, which rope would you ask me to throw you to help save your life? Would you choose rope A or rope B? Think about that for just a second. Okay, hopefully that didn't take you too long but hopefully you picked rope B. And why would you have picked rope B? Probably because it's larger. If you picked rope A, a one millimeter tiny little rope, that might snap and break. And that would not help you. That would do the opposite. That would cause you to fall down. Now, let's ask a different question, or tweak this question a little bit. If I now told you that the ropes actually weren't made of the same materials, rope A was made of nylon, and rope B was made of tissues. Which rope would you ask for now and why? Think about that. Okay, now this makes the question interesting. Even if the tissues were puffs, which a nose in need deserves puffs indeed, which are the world's most strongest tissue, you probably would pick A because we know that nylon is stronger than tissues. Now, what this tells us in this silly, ridiculous question is that two things matter when we start to deal with materials and strength. We care about the cross-sectional area that the material has because the larger the cross-sectional area, the more material we have and the more likely that system is to be stronger. The second thing we also care about in the strength of our structural system is the materials that we have. You could probably guess you'd much rather build your house out of nylon than you would tissues because we know that nylon is a much stronger material. And that's why you probably picked a nylon rope in this particular example as well. Both of these things, cross-sectional area and the material properties of a system will impact its strength. And that's what we're gonna to start to talk about and introduce throughout this lecture and moving forward in the class. Now, you probably don't need an introduction to this because you've probably felt just like this person here before. But let's talk about stress. And to do that, I'm going to show you a little video. For today's lecture, I want to start off with a demo. And it's a great thing that you're here today, Mike. Hey, Mike. What I want you to do is I want you to put the ball between your legs into this hole. All right. Very good. Now, let's raise the stakes a little bit. Mike, I want you to do the same thing. 
butt this time. What I want you to do is put the ball between your legs into this hole, but if you miss, you are never allowed to bake for your students again, ever. No exceptions. Even if they all get 100 on the top. <laughs> you missed. That's the point of today's lecture. I was easily able to make the putt in the first shot because it was just for fun. It was me challenging myself. But in the second example, the stakes were raised. And we all know when there's added pressure, there's added stress. And when you're stressed out, you don't do as good. And that's what today's topic is going to be all about. Stress. And guess what? The equation for stress is, you guessed it, the same for pressure. Now, I hope you'll forgive my really cheesy jokes and my poor video editing skills in that last segment, but hopefully the concept is clear. Stress is pressure. They are the exact same thing, and we've all felt that before. When you're under a lot of pressure to do something, you feel stress. And the equation for stress and pressure is the same. It's force over area, or F over A. And commonly, there are lots of different units that we'll work with in this class. We don't deal with atmospheres, but I've put that unit there to give you some context. Now, typically the units we'll be dealing with in this class are one or the other. They're Pascals or PSI. Pascals are actually a very small unit of pressure. One atmosphere of pressure in Pascals is 101,325 Pascals. The same atmosphere of pressure represented in PSI is 14.7 PSI. So you can see that PSI is a much beefier form of pressure than Pascals. So if you have one PSI, that's way more than one Pascal. And that gives you a little bit of context. Now the reason I'm also showing you this is so that you can put your answers into context, when you're dealing with structural strength and things like that, it's good to understand atmospheric pressure as your baseline. If you get that some piece of steel is gonna break at one one millionth of an atmosphere of pressure, well, that would mean that it would have failed just sitting around on Earth. So that doesn't make any sense. We know that to cause things to fail, we're gonna likely need more than one atmosphere of pressure. And to put things really into context, let's look at some steel. If we have a structural steel, we can look up in the material properties section that its ultimate tensile strength is 400 megapascals. That's a lot. How many atmospheres of pressure is that? Well, if we take 400 megapascals and divide by the equivalent atmospheric pressure in megapascals, we find out that to break steel in tension, pull it apart, we would need to provide 3,947 Earth atmospheres of pressure. That just explains to you how strong materials like steel can be and how it's possible to build such massive structures that we do. But hopefully this puts things into context and shows you how impressive materials really are. Now in order to understand stress, we need to jump back a little bit and talk about internal forces, a topic we've discussed before. Now when you cut through a beam, remember that you're essentially making a fixed support at the cut. And when you analyze the forces that were happening inside that beam, you found a P, normal force, going in the X direction. You found a V going in the Y direction, which is shear force. And you found a bending moment, M, going clockwise or counterclockwise. Now, this is all well and good, and it's really important to understand what's happening inside of the materials, but realistically, this isn't really true. This is a good representation of what's happening, but it's not the whole picture. Remember before when we did this comparison, when we draw mg as a dot or whether we draw mg as a distributed load. Remember that in this class and in the real world, technically speaking, all forces are distributed loads. So what that means is that the internal forces we showed are not actually what's happening. They're a simplification of a distributed load that's happening inside of our beam. Let me explain more. So realistically, any structure that we cut through to analyze the internal loads, P, V, and M, 
those forces are actually happening over some sort of cross-sectional area through the centroid. That's what we're modeling out when we draw P, V, and M. But what we really need to start to understand is we need to factor in the cross-sectional area of the material. We need to know that, and what we need to do is develop the stress inside of those systems. Now this is exactly where we get to this concept of normal stress. What normal stress is, is it's the normal force, P, the X direction of internal loads, divided by the cross-sectional area of that material. And you can see that down below. That sigma is going to represent normal stress, and P is the force that that beam or cable is subjected to, and the A is the cross-sectional area of that material. To blow this up a little bit bigger, you can even see it right here. Again, our internal force acts over an area, and that's what's going to be developed into our stress. And it's this stress that we really need to analyze and understand when we start to do example problems and design structures to see if they're going to be strong enough given the loading conditions. So now let's do a couple of different example problems. Let's look at this question right here. What we've got is a beam, AB, and it's got two cables on it. One of those cables holds weight one on the left, and the other cable goes down through a little pulley just to redirect the force to a cable uh, holding W2. And we can see that this beam is inclined at an angle of 50 degrees, and that the rope on the right is inclined at an angle of 35 degrees to the horizontal. Now, if we're given that W1 is 1,000 pounds and bar AB is weightless, we're asked to solve for the tensions in the cables. Now, I want you to take maybe 15, 20 seconds and just think about how would you go about solving for the tensions in the cable on the left and the cable on the right. And I'll give you one hint, which is that you probably already know the tension on the left side. That's very easy to solve for. But how are you going to solve for the tension on the right? Pause your video and just think through this problem conceptually for a second, and then I'll come back and explain the solution. Let me go over how you would now do this problem. It's actually pretty tricky, because if you look here, you might say, okay, if I know the tension on the left, I don't know the pin reaction forces AX or AY, and I don't know the cable. So that's three unknowns. So if we have three unknowns, we're going to need to do a moments equation. But what's really tricky here is in order to do some, some moments, we need distances. But in this question, we have no distance. We don't even know how long the beam AB is. Well, that's actually the trick in this problem, is that if you're going to do moments, both of your cables attach to point B. And as a result, every single moment arm or distance that you use in this problem is going to be a factor of AB. And as a result, you'll be able to get rid of that term altogether. Now let me show you how this kind of works out. What you'll want to do is develop a sum of the moments about point A. And when you do this, what you'll find is that you've got 1000 AB cosine 50, which is the weight of 1, or tension in 1, times, using line of action sliding it down, the X distance. You have also have the X and Y components of the other tension, which I've drawn here in red and blue. W2 sine of 35 is the Y component, and that's going to be multiplied by the same thing that the tension 1 of 1,000 pounds is multiplied by, which is AB cosine 50. And then you're also going to have the X component in red, W2 cosine 35, times the Y component of the system. Now to show you that a little bit more clearly, we take AB, we do some basic trig, we find out that the Y component is AB sine of 50, and that the X component is AB cosine of 50. When we do all of that together, hopefully this diagram makes some sense now, we're multiplying our Y forces in the tension by the X distance, and we're multiplying our X force of the tension by the Y distance. So when we do all that, what we get is that the tensions are the following. The tension one, is 1,000 pounds, which we already knew, because if we make a cut through cable one, we draw a free, uh, free body diagram, then we find that W1 goes down and the tension one goes up. Those things are gonna be equal. Tension two is really what we're using this formula here to solve. And because you can see that AB is in every single one of those terms, 
the first, second, and third, we just cross out AB in each of those terms. And we can solve for our unknown, which was tangent 2. And I'll just jump now to a handwritten solution of this problem as well, where I can explain it a little bit more clearly, but if you really understood this explanation, feel free to jump forward to question B. Here we have a standard 2D rigid body equilibrium problem that, in parts B and C, will start to delve into material stresses and safety factor. So, part A asks us to solve for the tensions in the cables of the one on the left and the one that connects over here to weight number two. The only thing that we're told in this problem is that weight one is 1,000 pounds and that bar AB is weightless. Now people generally look at this problem when I give it to them and they say, wait, this is impossible. How are we gonna solve for anything if we don't know W2? This is not possible, but it actually is. Hopefully the video instructions that I gave on the PowerPoint slides are pretty helpful, but effectively what you're gonna do is use the fact that at point A, you can sum your moments. If you sum your moments about point A, you have one unknown, which is the weight W1, and then you have one other unknown, which is the tension in this cable. So, by writing the sum of the moments, one equation about point A, you can solve for the one unknown, which is the weight of box two, or if we look at a section cut right here, is the tension in this cable on the right. Tension must be W2. So the way that I set this up was effectively to look at force W1. That's gonna be pulling on our rod down and to the left counterclockwise. And this force over here is gonna be broken into two components. The component in the X direction and the component in the Y direction, which will come down right here. Now the only thing we don't yet know is the distance AB. But what's interesting about this question is that because every single one of these forces is gonna be multiplied by the distance AB, then that actually will go away from our equation. So the way that this gets set up is we first wanna look at this distance AB in question. And the way that I do that over here is I just say, here's our distance AB, here's our 50 degrees. So the distance in the X is going to be AB cosine of 50. And the distance in the Y is AB sine of 50 degrees. So to set up our sum of the moments about point A, we'll say sum of the moments about point A equals zero is going to be equal W1 times this distance right here, down at the bottom, using the line of action. So I'll draw that over here. That gets us a value of 1,000 pounds times the distance AB cosine 50. And that's our distance in green. Then we have to look at what the blue component and the red component are, or the y and the x component of our force tension two, pretty much. Well, if we see our cable right here, it's inclined in a 35 degree angle. So the y component is going to be w2 sine of 35, and this up here is going to be w2 cosine of 35. Once we figure that out, then all we have to do is say that W2 sine of 35 is going to be multiplied by AB cosine 50. That'll cause a counterclockwise moment, so that'll be positive, so plus W2 sine of 35 times AB cosine of 50. And just to keep things straight over here, I'll put the green right there, and then I'll put the blue on our force, which is this one right here, so we can see that. Then we're gonna have W cosine 35 times the distance up here, which is actually AB sine of 50. So we have, that's gonna cause clockwise, so that's negative, so minus W2 cosine 35 times AB sine of 50. So that's clockwise. This was counterclockwise. 
and this one over here was also counterclockwise. Now, going back to the earlier point I made, we don't need to know the length of AB because AB is in every single one of these terms. So what actually happens is that the AB can cancel out and we get rid of it. And by doing that, we have only one unknown, which is W2, or really, tension 2. And by solving this equation, we can find that tension 2 is equal to 2,484 pounds. And from before, by looking at this cable over there, we already know that tension 1 was equal to the weight of 1, which is 1,000 pounds. So this is a really good like review problem for 2D rigid body equilibrium because it's actually a little tricky in that because you don't know this distance here, you actually can divide it out and everything kind of works out in the end. Even though in the beginning you might think you're doomed. But we're good. The first question we just did, question A, was really nothing new. It was a review of 2D rigid body equilibrium. Now in parts B and C, we'll start to delve into this new part of the problems where we'll start to calculate stresses and safety factors. So part B of this question asks if both cables have a diameter of 0.8 inches and are made out of quote unquote 8020 brass A, which is just a type of material you can use, uh, we want to know will the system fail. Now on our page on ELMS, you'll be able to find a resource that has all the material properties for the materials that you'll use in the homework and the group work. That'll tell you the strength, stress, and all that stuff. So in that resource, in the appendix, I'm calling it, you'll find that the sigma yield, or the yield stress, is equal to 7.2 KSI. Now, what that is, is that's going to be the limit that we use to calculate the stress in this particular example. That means that if you were to apply 7.2 KSI of stress, some force over the cross-sectional area, if you were to develop that much stress on our material, it would fail. And I'll explain this more in the material properties lecture, but just take that at face value right now, that that's our limit that we don't want to exceed. So if we know that the diameter of these cables is 0.8 inches, and we now know the tension developed in both cables, I can calculate the stress and determine whether or not the system is strong enough to hold everything together. And I'm gonna to jump to the handwritten solution to show you how I calculate these values right now. Now we can look at question B, which asks us if both cables have a diameter of 0.8 inches and are made out of quote-unquote 8020 brass A, which we're told in the appendix has a sigma yield of 7.2 KSI, the question asks us, will the system fail? Well, this is the first time that this question brings up anything related to stress. So what do we know about stresses? We know that stress is equal to pressure. And we also know that pressure is equal to force over area. If we know that pressure is force over area and what we're asked to solve for is the sigma that our cables are experiencing right now, which this is the normal stress or the stress developed due to tension in the cables. Well, we know the force in each cable and we've just been told the diameter of each cable. So what we can do is we can solve for the stress in cable one by saying that it's the tension in cable one over the cross-sectional area of cable one. Well, that's going to be 1,000 pounds divided by the cross-sectional area. Well, the area of a circle is pi r squared or pi over four times diameter squared. Now, where does that come from? Well, quick review, the area of a circle is pi r squared. Pi r squared can be rewritten as pi times the diameter over 2 squared. And what you can see this becomes is this just becomes pi times the diameter squared over 4 because we have essentially 1 half squared. So I like to use this and this is because we are often given diameter in questions. This way we don't have to convert anything, we can just use this right away. So pretty much now we can plug in everything we know, so it's 1000 divided by pi over 4 times 8 inches, or sorry, 0 0.8 inches squared. 8 inches would be a very large cable. So when we do that, what we get is 1,900 
and 89 pounds per inch squared, which we like to say is 1,989 PSI. Now if we look, the sigma yield we've been given is in KSI. So KSI stands for kilopounds per square inch. So 1,989 PSI is really 1.9 8.9 KSI. And because this is less than sigma yield, it does not fail. Now we can look at sigma 2. Sigma 2 is going to be tension 2 over the area of cable 2. That gives us a value of 2484 pounds divided by the same area we just had above because we're assuming that both cables are 0 0.8 inches in diameter. And what that gives us is a value of 4,942 PSI, or 4.942 KSI. Again, because this value is less than sigma yield of 7.2 KSI, our structure does not fail. And because of that, we are some happy engineers. Woohoo! Let's give our guy a cool little hat. Now let's talk about safety factor. And as engineers, we know that safety is ultra important. It should always be safety first. So what is safety factor? I mean, we know it's about safety and safety is good, but what does it mean? Really, it's measuring a system's level of safety how safe it is. It's a way to quantify that. And the way that we do this is, you know, in the real world, engineers will over design a system to be able to support more weight than is expected to actually be on that system. And this is what's kind of called safety factors. It's, it's the, the numerical value that engineers over design the system just to be safe. So safety first, obviously, and the way that we develop this calculation to determine what safety factor is, is we say that safety factor is equal to the maximum limit of a material. So that's like the limit that a material would have before it failed. Like the max limit of that material. And we divide that by the designed load. Now typically, we want the numerator to be greater than the denominator. Because if the max limit of our material is 2, we want to make sure that that material in our design will only experience one. That way our material will be twice as safe as it should, as it needs to be really, but that gives us a good feeling inside that as engineers our system is not going to fail. Let me illustrate this concept a little bit more clearly with an example. What we can see here is a freaking really cool bridge held up by two hands. It's the Kua Vong Bridge in Vietnam and the numbers I'm giving you here are fake but let's just say that this bridge was big enough that if every single person stood shoulder to shoulder on this bridge over the entire walkway area, let's say it could hold 1,000 people at a single time. Now, if you're the engineer designing this bridge, you want to think about safety because it would be really bad if this bridge failed and all of the people fell off. So in order to do this, you're not going to design your bridge to hold exactly 1,000 people because if you did, if a pigeon flew over and pooped, and that poop landed on one of the people on your bridge, the whole bridge would collapse because you'd have the weight of 1,000 people and one pigeon poop. That would not be good. What you do as an engineer is you say, okay, my bridge can only ever fit 1,000 people. So what I want to do is make sure that my bridge is strong enough to hold more than that. I'm going to make it hold 3,000 people. That way, I am certain that there's no way this bridge could ever be overloaded and have more weight than, than possible. This would require that every single person on the bridge had two people on their shoulders. And I am confident as an engineer that that's not going to happen and that this will result in me making a safe bridge. And at the end of the day, the safety factor that you would develop then would be that your design the materials you'll choose will have a limit that can hold 3,000 people. But the actual design you're building is going to only have 1,000 people on the bridge. 
And as a result, this means that your system is three times as safe as it really needs to be. But that's good news for you. Now, I guess one thing to really mention here is that there are trade-offs. As an engineer, you don't want your safety factor to be a billion. Because every time you make your structure safer, you're adding probably time in construction and you're adding material cost. And really there's this limit. You want your, your structure to be safe, but not so ridiculously safe that it takes you a million years to build it and costs an infinite amount of money. So there's always this trade-off. And in the real world, there's safety factors for you know aerospace and naval design and buildings. And it all kind of deals with the economics of these systems. Another really good example of this uh, safety factor used in psychology and engineering design is the following. How many of you have ever taken your car to the empty point on your gas tank? I know I have, and I've gotten a little yellow like dot on my car where it's like, dude, you better go get gas. But when you reach the empty, does your car just immediately stop? No, it doesn't. Empty is actually a lie on your gas tank. If you've ever taken your car to empty, you know that it can go even below empty. Every car carries a little over a gallon of gas beneath the empty, so you've got another 20 to 30 miles usually before you really, really run out of gas. And this is great news for sometimes lazy people like me when you don't feel like getting gas. But engineers know that you're not going to go get gas sometimes, uh, even if it's on empty. You're going to wait until like you really need that message that like, oh crap, my car is about to run out of gas. So it's this extra safety factor in the fuel system that allows people to not run out of gas more often. And a cool, interesting story about this is uh, the Tesla Model S actually has a system in its batteries that doesn't allow you to take the battery past empty. We all know that if you take a battery below 10%, 5%, that can sometimes damage the battery permanently. It'll never fully charge again. So Teslas limit you to maybe to get to 15 or 10% of the battery's capacity for your vehicle. Now, normally this wouldn't be that bad of a thing. It's similar to like what a car manufacturer does in a way. Um, but if you live in Florida, this could be a really big problem for you if you have a Tesla. Now, why is that the case? Imagine if in Florida you have a hurricane coming and you need to evacuate. Imagine if your Tesla can't go as far on a charge as it really could. It's possible that if you're trying to evacuate a storm, you can't make it out because Tesla's putting this arbitrary restriction on how far your battery can be drained. So what's really interesting is in instances of hurricanes and things like that in Florida, Tesla will send a patch over the air to all the vehicles in that state pretty much that allows them to actually drain their batteries further to give them extra range to potentially evacuate a dangerous situation. Another example of safety factor used in the real world. Now we've done a couple problems related to stress and we just talked about safety factor. So let's apply safety factor to the problem we were discussing before. Now if we look at safety factor, we just calculated the material stresses a little while ago in cable one and in cable two. And what we're gonna wanna do is maybe think about, well, what's the overall safety factor of the system? And what were the safety factors of the cables that we had thus far? Now in terms of safety factor, it's really important to understand that you are only as strong as your weakest link just like the TV show. In our last example, the safety factor of cable one would be 7.2 KSI, the limit of the material, divided by the stress in that cable. So the safety factor in the cable on the left would be 3.63. The safety factor for the cable on the right would be again the same limit of the brass material, 7.2 KSI, divided by the tension developed in that material, which is 4.94 KSI. Now, what we would find is that the safety factor of cable BC, the one on the right, would be 1.45. So it's not as safe as the other cable because it's carrying more load. It's more likely to fail. That is our limiting factor. And as a result, that cable is the weakest link of the whole system and therefore governs the safety factor of the whole system. So the safety factor of this whole structure here is the lowest safety factor of all of the elements of that structure. 
and it is a value of 1.45. So in safety factor, remember, the weakest link is what governs your safety factor for the whole system. Now what we'll do is solve this question here, which is very similar to everything we've done thus far, and we'll emphasize safety factor a little more. The question asks if we need an overall safety factor of 2.2 in this question, then what would be the minimum diameter we need in both cables to create this safety factor, if both cables have to have the same diameter? I'm going to jump to the handwritten solution now and show you how to solve this. Now let's look at question C. Question C says, if the system needs an overall safety factor of 2.2, what is the minimum diameter allowed, assuming that both cables will have the same diameter? So this question is related to safety factor. And as we just discussed a second ago, safety factor is essentially, you guessed it, how safe a structure is. So that's going to give us the maximum limit divided by like what it's actually experiencing. So this is our equation for safety factor. We know in this particular question that the, the max limit is our sigma yield, 7.2 KSI. And we'll talk more about what sigma yield means in material properties, but we just put it here now as a kind of way to introduce stress. So for the safety factor of one, if we want to set that equal to 2.2, that's going to be equal to the max limit, which is 7.2 KSI, divided by what this cable is actually experiencing. So that would be kind of this equation right here for stress. So now we're going to put 1,000 divided by pi over 4 times the diameter squared. And what we get out of this equation is we can solve for the diameter, and we get the diameter minimum would be equal to 0 0.6237. If we repeat this process for cable 2, we say the safety factor of cable 2, if we set that equal to 2.2, that will again equal the limit of the material, 7.2 KSI, over what the material is actually experiencing, which is 2484 pounds, divided by pi over 4 d squared. And I've realized now this actually should be in kips because if we're having KSI on the top, then we want to have 1,000 pounds beneath it. So here I need to actually put in 1 kip, and down here is 2.484 kip. Sorry for that mistake. But when we do this, again, we can solve for diameter, and the diameter minimum is going to be equal to 0. 0.9426 inches. So the question was, what's the minimum diameter for the whole system to have a safety factor of 2.2 if we make both cables the same diameter? Now if we look, if we made the, both cables a diameter of 0 0.623, then this cable down here, cable 2, wouldn't have been able to have a 2.2 safety factor. This is the limiting factor right here. It's the cable that's the largest is going to be the one that governs. So in the end, for question C, if we make this, you know, if we make the cable one inch up at the top, it's going to have a much larger safety factor than 2.2. If we make the cable 500 inches wide, it's going to have an even higher safety factor. So what we need to do is we need to pick the highest value of these ones right here because this is the minimum diameter needed for this cable, which is experiencing the most force. So because cable 2 is the limiting factor here, the minimum diameter for question C is that the diameter minimum overall must be at least 0 0.9426 inches. There you have it. That's this problem here. We did a little bit of 2D rigid body equilibrium. We talked a little bit about stress and we then kind of finished with some safety factor, but an overall good problem to do. That's it for today's lecture. Hopefully you learned a little bit more about stress and safety factor and you enjoyed my terrible and cheesy jokes. And I'll see you next time.